He is the voice of BYU Athletics. Greg Rebell joins us on 365 Sports. And, of course, we've had a very healthy conversation about what may be next. What is the holdup? When will something come down? Anything Pac-12? Brigham Young, by the way, as I said earlier, also started spring drills, and that's why we asked Greg to come on the show, and we'll get some other information from him and opinions too. Greg, thanks for your time. So is the Keaton Slovis story the biggest story at BYU spring camp? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, losing Jaron Hall to, uh, to, the, to the next level. Uh, Jaron was uh, at the NFL Combine this past week. In fact, there were three BYU players at the Combine. One who really made waves, offensive lineman Blake, Blake Freeland, uh, broke a bunch of records for O-linemen. But uh, Blake Freeland, uh, Jalen, uh, Jaron Hall, and Puka Nakua, that's an O-lineman, a quarterback, and a, and a wide receiver were all at the Combine this past week. And they are among the shoes BYU has to fill on offense. And Keaton Slovis is looked to to fill uh, the cleats of uh, Jaron Hall. And uh, you know, Keaton is a guy with a lot of P5 reps, uh, a, a, a long track record. And BYU is hoping to kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of resurrect uh, his uh, numbers from previous seasons, excepting last season at Pitt. Last year was not a good year for him. But I think the BYU coaches are fairly convinced that that was more of a function of the offense and the style of offense where they had him playing and how they had him taking snaps as opposed to what they'll have him do at BYU. So I think Keaton Slovis uh, being a, a big-name transfer and a guy that a lot of teams wanted, guys. Uh, when he hit the portal, there were a lot of high-level teams wanting his services. BYU got his services, and now they will, they will be riding him into the Big 12. I, I think, you know, looking back, guys, the hope was that Jaron Hall would be the first Big 12 quarterback for BYU. But he jumped to the next level, and so they didn't want to really start from scratch uh, with a younger player or even a Juco. Uh, Keaton Slovis gives him a nice uh, leg up on that position heading into the P5. Do they nor- – I mean, they normally do have their – you know, you, you have to deal with mission trips and everything, I, I know, Greg, but uh, they normally have a pretty steady, this guy leaves, this guy's ready. But was there just too much of a gap between Jaron Hall and the, the next wave? Yeah, Jacob Conover was the next guy, but even before last year's bowl game, he hit the portal and went back home to Arizona, uh, will be at Arizona State. Uh, and, and, and Conover was a pretty high, uh, high recruit himself. But you know, the way it is these guys, these guys, guys you know, the, the, the long-range plans rarely come to fruition. It, it, it's so much uh, a reaction to who wants you know, the greener pastures. You've got to hit the portal and you've got to have something ready to go. Uh, back in the day, I'll say my day, uh, when I was a student at BYU and, and even prior to me and, and, and through my early days as a broadcaster at BYU, you generally saw a quarterback sit for a couple of years and then play for a couple of years. And that was kind of the rotation. With all the BYU quarterbacking greats, they'd watch for a couple of years and, they could, and then get a couple of years as a starter, maybe three if they're lucky. That's not the way it is anymore. Greg, what have been some of the uh, early returns on – uh, the change at defensive coordinator with Jay Hill coming in, just the, the idea of, of pivoting after, you know, obviously feeling like the defense wasn't up to snuff. Kalani Sataki makes the change, and, and kind of how has that all uh, sort of been over the last couple of months and obviously about to learn a lot more as they hit the field. Yeah, that's the other big storyline. You mentioned Keaton Slovis. I would also add that the O-line is another uh, major talking point. The Cougs lost five of their top eight offensive linemen from last season. That is something they have, that, that needs to be addressed. But, the, the, but then the entire defense becomes the story. And, and last year's defensive numbers just were not good enough. Uh, they were 121st in, in, in third down defense. Uh, they were 113th in first down defense. Uh, they were not getting takeaways. They were 117th in, in turnovers gained. Uh, they were not getting tackles for loss, 129th there. Uh, they, were, they were not getting sacks. Uh, 129 there. Uh, it was just not a playmaking defense. They were not good in the red zone, 101st there. So essentially, you're looking for a playmaking defense to emerge from Jay Hill and his new leadership as the D coordinator. And although it was only the FCS level, it was high level FCS play. Uh, Jay Hill had a great thing going at Weber State, and they hung their hat on defense. Last year's defense was fifth in third down. Uh, last year's defense was 13th in first downs allowed. Uh, last year's defense was uh, aggressive um, in takeaways, top 25, 21st in turnovers gained. Uh, they were a great scoring defense, uh, 12th nationally. So even at the FCS level, you can draw some conclusions about how Jay Hill coaches defense, and they've been a great defense at Weber State. 
and they took one of their best players um, uh, to, to BYU. Eddie Hecker is, is an all-American Juco corner, and he will look to show up the secondary for BYU. But I think it has to happen up front, guys. There, there was just not enough time spent in the opposing backfield. I mentioned the tackles for loss and sacks numbers. More plays have to be made by this defense to, to bring them closer to the really solid offensive numbers BYU's turned in. The offense really wasn't the issue and hasn't been the issue for a while. Uh, the defensive numbers have to get better and a lot better. You mentioned uh, the offensive line, and, and you mentioned that, that Weber State's bringing somebody along uh, with what you said at the cornerback position. The Carrington brothers are now at Baylor. Uh, Mateos and Grimes and even Aranda with this great, great relationship with Kalani Sataki. Uh, is Brigham Young kind of like, okay, that's enough. You've taken enough players and enough coaches from BYU? Yeah, maybe it's good they're not playing this year uh, in, in BYU's first Big 12 schedule. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if there are any hard feelings there, but it is interesting that, uh, that, that Coach Grimes, Coach Mateos, and now the Barrington brothers yep. uh, go to Waco. And before that, Caleb Lohner on the hardwoods, you could also add. So there are some funny connections that way between BYU and Baylor in the Big 12. And it is interesting that in the first Big 12 schedule, Baylor is a team that BYU skips. And, and maybe that's okay, too, because they did play each of the last two years. And so um, there was some familiarity already there. Nice to see some other teams in the Big 12. But that, that, that is a unique storyline. And, and, and believe me, Baylor got two really good offensive linemen. Uh, Clark's been playing longer, but Campbell, the younger brother, uh, may be even better than Big Bro. And, and I think that was a tough loss for BYU. Uh, nice kids, too. We, I did uh, sit down interviews with both of them a, a couple weeks ago, uh, Greg, here in the in the studio. And uh, and I, I think those are up, by the way, for our listeners on Sikkim365.com in the premium section right now. But uh, what hit BYU harder? Graduation guys going to the NFL, like Jared Hall, Puka Nakua, uh, what is a, a Freeland, the offensive lineman, who's, who's really showing out yep. well uh, lately? Or was it the, the portal? Um, maybe sixes because I think you could you could argue just with the guys we just mentioned, uh, they were kind of equally hard hit. Of course, the, the portal is is less expected. I think um, graduation or if not even graduation, guys who've been here four or five years, and and with the COVID year maybe available to them, you kind of expect them to go. But I think you know that there was some thought that you know maybe they could have someone like a Jaron Hall leading BYU into the Big Twelve. They were ready for it, but let's remember that you know Nakua and Freeland. And, uh, and the Hall all had eligibility left remaining at BYU had they chosen to play one more year and get BYU into the Big 12. I think there was some hope, too, that, that maybe there would be an appeal to those players of playing a P5 schedule and, and maybe even have that help them um, kind of, uh, you know, boost their portfolio for the next level. But that said, they're, they're, they're taking their chance now, and I think all showed pretty well uh, in the opportunities they had uh, both at the uh, Senior Bowl and at Combine. Greg, you mentioned uh, no Baylor on the upcoming Big 12 schedule. Uh, I think everybody did the same thing, like who's in, who's out as far as the, you know, the teams that you know, obviously you're going to play and then the ones you'll miss out on. But I don't know, I feel like uh, it's a pretty healthy draw for the Cougars. I mean, you're going to see Texas down in Austin, going to host Oklahoma. I think that uh, that first part of the Big 12 schedule, uh, or actually prior to that, playing Arkansas on the road, then playing Kansas on the road, Cincinnati, TCU, yeah. Texas. I mean, it's a – I know they played great schedules, but uh, it, what's the excitement level and just what's kind of the initial returns, initial opinions on what's ahead of them in 2023? Well, I think you could ask any BYU fan, and regardless of how this first schedule came out, it was going to be the best schedule ever for BYU because it was finally a P5 schedule. It was a Big 12 schedule. However, the names ended up on the slate. But, yeah, uh, you start with two games. You're, you're, you're going to win at home. You'd think Sam Houston and New FBS and then Southern Utah and FCS. But then it goes back-to-back games. Uh, two letters of, of difference between Arkansas and Kansas, but they'll be on the road for both of those in Fayetteville and in Lawrence. And that game September 23rd. That's the, the red-letter day, right? That's the first ever game that BYU will play as a Big 12 member against a Big 12 member. BYU and KU and Lawrence, so looking forward to that. Uh, you already mentioned how BYU goes to Austin. They've had good success against the Longhorns. In fact, you look at the, you look at the departing teams, Texas and Oklahoma, and I think BYU's 4-1 and one against those two teams all time. They'll have Texas on the road and, and OU in Provo. And bringing, bringing uh, OU into Provo – in November, who knows what the weather will be like in the mountains in mid-November. So let's see how, how, how the Sooners react to that. 
that'll be an inter- interesting game, no doubt. Uh, but I look at this first schedule, guys, and, and I think um, you know there are a few goals you'd have in mind. I think the first goal is get to a bowl game. Can you get to a bowl game with the schedule? The next one is can you get uh, can you get a winning record with the schedule? And then maybe beyond that is can you possibly be in contention in your first year in this league when November rolls around? That might be a big ask in year one. But I think those might be, you know, three nice, you know, benchmarks to keep in mind as the season goes along for BYU. Well, and Brigham Young gets to bring Taysom Hill back for Texas, right? That that is in the contract. They, yeah. uh-huh. they, they get to have him in. With all due respect to Slovis, Taysom Hill gets to play in who, that game against the Horns. Who is the quarterback it's, in Bush? It, 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 it's a special rider that they that they've worked out. It's unique, <laughs> but uh, it's the COVID year. It. Yeah, it's the COVID it, waiver. Yeah. Max Hall that beat Oklahoma though. What's that? Who was the court? Was it Max Hall that beat Oklahoma? Uh, John Walsh beat him uh, back in the 90s, and then Max Hall in the 2009 in Arlington. Yeah, that, that's what I like. like. Oklahoma and Texas both got their dose of it. Yeah. Pretty, well, pretty, it's not as if yeah. Brigham Young hasn't yeah. had a bunch of no, really exactly, yeah. elite quarterbacks along the way. Hey, uh, we had Jay Catch on earlier, and, you know, Greg, he told me you got him into the business like 13 years ago and loves you and appreciates what you did in getting him involved. We were asking this question. As you know, the Pac-12 is still sitting right now with a little bit of the unknown, and if things work out, they work out, whatever happens. What is the thought process in Provo if, in fact, it doesn't work out and the possibility that has to mean Utah has to be interested of Utah in the Big 12 in the future. Well, I, I think BYU's already grown accustomed now to, to being apart from Utah, and the rivalry games get played less frequently now, and, and, and it's more of a hiatus than it is a regular thing. And so I think a lot of Cougar Nation's kind of grown accustomed to um, the, the two sides having parted ways. Um, if they were to come back together in a conference setting, I'm sure that, uh, that that there's a large segment of the population that would embrace uh, having Utah again as a conference rival. But uh, I, I think uh, it really does come down to what does George Kleopop hand the president here and the board of trustees in terms of a new deal and uh, and how appealing is it, how palatable is it uh, to those teams? Uh, I, I think there's some sense that um, that that, that – a deal that doesn't please everybody might might mean the you know quote unquote end of the Pac-12 as we know it. In which case, I think Brett Yormark and the and the Big 12 is ready to to to, to if not exactly pounce, make appropriate moves. But uh, I, I'm just, just genuinely curious. I want to see what kind of deal gets placed in front of those Pac-12 leaders to see just how happy they might be or not be with it. Uh, I I think ultimately BYU is kind of just uh, pleased with its its own circumstance. I think mm-hmm. they feel they've. Uh, They've entered a strong conference with a great future, and whoever's a part of that future, I think it's something BYU will accept uh, gladly no matter which way it drops. Well, Biscuits and Gravy on our chat room, I'll share this with you, Greg, and we appreciate your time always. I literally had people walk up to me at a BYU game. They were in Provo. He, she was in Provo. Grab my arm and say, we are so happy to be a part of the Big 12. Uh, and, and, of course, she welcomed her to the Big 12, and then BYU won that game, dramatic game in double overtime. But that kind of seems yeah. like that's been the reaction from everybody across the board from Provo. Well, it, it was a long grind, guys. 12 years of independence, it, it was a tough road. And, and, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, kind of bravery to go it alone for those 12 years. Uh, when BYU lost its conference colleague in Utah uh, to a P5 conference, and a year later TCU was gone, uh, to its own P5 setting in the Big 12, um, you know, the Cougars had to forge a path and and did so, I, I think, with, with great success, all things considered, during the Bronco Mendenhall era and now the Kalani Sitake era. So they, they weren't 12 easy years, but they really did prepare BYU for membership in the Big 12. And now that BYU is there, uh, Cougar Nation could not be more, be, be more excited. Uh, to see those names on the schedule, to know of the venues that BYU fans will soon be visiting, to welcome in fans from schools who've never been to Provo before. And I do hope that all the fans have experiences similar uh, to the Baylor fan you mentioned when they come to Lavelle Edwards Stadium because I think BYU fans are genuinely and, and wholeheartedly happy to have new conference colleagues and, and couldn't be more thrilled than to be a part of the Big 12. There's a lot of like-mindedness, 
and, and, and cultural good fits around the Big 12. I think by the same token, there are a lot of fans in Cougar Nation around the country who haven't gotten to see BYU play as much as they would like because the Cougars don't come to their neck of the woods that often. But now they will come to these new cities and new venues and new places, especially in the Midwest and the Southwest. And that's another great thing about it, too. And I think you'll, you and others will see just how well BYU draws when they go to these new cities that may not seem like a natural draw for a BYU, but the Cougars will bring those fans out. If they're close, even if they're not so close, they'll get to that city and get to that town and get to that stadium to watch their guys play. Greg, thank you as always. Look forward to it down the road. We're not far away, and uh, you've been great to be a part of our show. Whenever we've asked, we appreciate your time. I'm sure we'll have more conversations. Look forward to them, and uh, thanks as always, guys. Absolutely. We do, too. The voice of BYU with us on 365 Sports. We appreciate the time, and 